we have with us now our uh, second uh, guest of the day. Yeah. Huh? And it's, uh, I want to, I want to tell your last name, Chloe Mestagi. Yep, Chloe Mestagi. Oh, all righty, all righty. I'm gonna change my background for you guys. Hold on oh, a sec. No, you can leave that. Women in tech is fantastic. <laughs> um, there we go. That, that's cool. How are you, Chloe? I'm doing very well. How are you guys doing? Good, doing, thank you. Doing fantastic. So Salma, so so Salma, it's our uh, our co-host, and uh, just want to let you know she's been absorbing everything about infosec she's supposed to be taking her um a plus security exam today after a week oh. today i'm taking notes <laughs> <laughs> i'm preparing for my exam oh my god <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna rock it don't worry this is just helping you <laughs> well, it's been a really good experience for me i have been learning a lot of about uh, cybersecurity, really. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm totally new. So <laughs> for me, it's, it's a, a new experience, but it's been a really, really good experience. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear that. that. Chloe is, uh, I, I have to ask, because you're, you, you do a whole bunch of, I mean, you've done a whole bunch of training and presentations this past week. It's nonstop. And, and some of those presentations are exactly on Avoiding burnout. Yeah. And I'm like, hello, you've done like six presentations in one day. <laughs> I don't think that's the way to avoid burnout. <laughs> so, uh, Trick, um, half of them were pre recorded. So okay. that helps. So, three of them were pre recorded, and then the other three um, were live, but they were talks that were similar, like that I already know the material. So it was about like hacker rights and like burnout. So it was very easy, didn't take too much work. Plus that okay. whole entire week I had off for work to just focus on talks for Black okay. Hat and DEF CON. That makes, it, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so, yeah. so Salma, you've heard, now Salma knows everything about Black Hat and DEF CON uh, <laughs> because that's all she's been hearing about uh, this week. Yeah. And, uh, and it's fantastic. So Salma, tell us about Chloe. What do we know about Chloe? Chloe, Chloe is baggy. Correct, yes, good job. So she is the VP of strategy at Point3 Security. She's a security researcher. I advocate with the strongly beliefs that information security is a humanitarian issue. Besides her passion to keep people safe and empowered online and offline, she's driving to fight for hacker rights. She's the founder of Women Hackers and the president and co-founder of Women of Security, podcaster for ITSP Magazines, The Uncommon Journey, and runs the Hacker Book Club. So Chloe, welcome to Tactical Edge. And please tell us more about Women Hackers and Women of Security. Great. Yeah, sure. Um, so we recently changed our name, Women Hackers, to We Are Hackers. Um, to basically be more inviting to those that are marginalized genders. Um, basically, the group is for anyone online around the world can join if they are a hacker or if they're a very beginner, we'd love to have you. So basically, we wanted a platform where it's safe for those that um, are not usually represented in InfoSec, so non-male, cis males, we call um, and so it's a good way so then we can all kind of come together and support each other. But we also have workshops, we have events, um, but it's a really good place to find a job. It's also a place to learn from each other, support each other emotionally right now as well. Oh, what, yeah. And then WOSEC, we have chapters all over the world. Um, they used to be physical uh, because <laughs> you'd be able to go there in person. Uh, so now they're just virtual at this time until COVID-19 decides to um, get a little Shoot. bit better. <laughs> yeah. Shoot away. Go, go. No. But, yeah. we do? Okay, That's fantastic. Any, any um, upcoming events for these two groups that you want to let uh, us know? So we, so WOSEC, I will be announcing one later today. So if you keep an eye on Twitter, people. Um, but basically, it will be featuring Tanya Janka. So oh. uh, one of my co-founders. She's going to be nice. joining with OWASP as okay. well. So that's nice. going to be a fun one for WOSAC. Uh, Women Hackers, we are in the midst of getting some workshops 
like for uh, events coming up soon with the Many Hats Club. Beautiful. Cool. Yeah. Sounds really good. And, and your presentation, tell us about your presentation today. Wait, before we start with that, hold on a second, Sally, before we start with that, okay. um, I have a question. Your, okay. your dogs. So are they dogs or are they cats? What are they? Because the last photo that you put two of them on the couch. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Okay, so I have Shibas and Shibas, they're kind of, they're, they're like these dogs that are, tr basically they should be cats, but they're stuck in a dog's body, but they look like foxes too. Yeah. So I have two Shibas. One is a red Shiba that looks like a fox. Um, the other one's a black and tan, which kind of looks like a bear, like a very okay. tiny bear. Um, and they love to sit on the windowsill. They love to sit on the edge of the couch, not yeah. necessarily on the couch, but on the, like, the edges of the couch. And yeah. you sit there looking out the window. Yeah. It is... That was a funny picture. I love that yeah. picture. So, uh, all right. Alma, sorry, you were asking. Now please, now please tell us about your presentation. Sure. So the Hacker Hippocampus is a talk that we dive into gamification in general. How did gamification come about? What's the point of gamification? And then how that also is an infosec, followed by diving into the cognitive science of how gamification works. Um, so we'll be diving deep in the brain to find out how gaming works and whatnot. And then after that, we'll dive into some statistics and data around basically today's research around gamification and security. Um, and a lot of these points are gonna be around basically how this could be a good way to invest in your security team. But also this is a great talk for those that are red teamers as well. Um, and then we dive into some personal stories and then then I get to do Q and A, but this is an entire gamified talk on gamification. So Ooh. people have questions, or if they want to give me answers, they have to do it in the Q and A. Okay. Because there will be pop quiz throughout the entire time. Wow. To okay. stimulate a, your brain. So it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky uh, because uh, we're delayed. So. <laughs> Whatever they see on the platform, they see it 30 seconds later. So we'll see That's how it fine. works. That's fine. I'll okay. just make sure there's a 30 second pause <laughs> over it, but I can always read over it afterwards. Okay. And then whoever okay. got the most of them correct, okay. um, they get to win something special. Oh, oh wow. beautiful. All right. Yeah. So make sure that you uh, listen to uh, the questions and uh, participate in the Q&A yeah. tab in the platform. So we'll be paying attention. Perfect. So Sounds good. You have control. The stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So hold on one sec. All right. Can everyone see my screen in a yeah. giant hack or a hippocampus on it? Excellent. I can see it. All right. So because there's a lot of things in here, I'm going to have my camera off so you don't see me looking down the entire time but I'll turn it back on for the Q&A portion and when it comes to closing. Sound good? Excellent, I take that as a yes. All right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone to Hacker Hippocampus. My name is Chloe Mistagi, and I think you know pretty much about me since we went over about myself, but in case you didn't know, um, I am the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. I'm an ethical hacker advocate. In other words, what I like to do is do whatever I can to bring rights to the hacker community. Um, if that also means trying to help the community in any way to try to enforce um, CISOs and whatnot to start investing in their team when it comes to your mental health or to make sure to just start caring about you a little bit more, that's the stuff that I do. I'm also the president co-founder of WOSEC, which is Women in Security founder of We Are Hackers, formerly known as Women Hackers, um, also the Hacker Book Club organizer. We read a new book written by someone in the hacker community every month, and the author attends, and also those that are mentioned in the book also attend uh, weekly uh, around 5 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. Um, also, a podcaster for ITSP Magazine is The Uncommon Journey with Phil Wiley and Alyssa Miller. And that is my URL. So if you want to know anything about me, it's on there along with, yeah, all recordings, anything you want to know, it's probably on there. 
Um, that is my Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to follow. And my DMs are always open. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out. I'm here for you. So let's dive into the agenda today. So we're going to dive into the history of gamification, how our brains are stimulated by it, why gamification helps security teams, how gamification has transformed lives, and we will also do a Q&A. Now, I just want to remind you that this is a completely interactive talk. So in the Q&A section, if you type in answers at any time where I say, okay, let me know what your answer is, you may be able to win something really fun, um, which is a subscription to a platform so you guys can play around as well. All right, so here we go. What is gamification? Well, first is the process of like adding games or game-like elements to something such as a task so as to encourage participation. But overall, it's games that work on problem solving, processing speed, attention spans, and memory. Now, I wanna let you guys know the history of gamification is the driest part of this talk. However, if you pay attention, you could win something. All right, so this is a lovely graph of everything about gamification and how gamification became how it's known today. So in 425 BC, dice games were created to fight major famine. In 3100 BC, the first board game was created in Egypt. S&H green stamp marketers basically sold these stamps to retailers who used them to reward customers. 1958, the first video game was invented. Charles Cordeau founds a consulting firm called The Game of Work and brings the feedback loops found in sports into the workplace. MUD1 is created by Roy Trogshaw at Essex University. It was the first multi-user virtual world game. Now, Thomas Malone publishes What Makes Things Fun to Learn, a study of interestingly motivating computer games. In 1981, the first ever 3D video games were released. American Airlines introduces a advantage, the first frequent flyer program. Holiday Inn launches the first hotel loyalty program, and the National Car Rental launches the first car rentals rewards program. Now at this point, 30% of American households own an NES. A new generation of gamers is now born. Richard Barrow publishes Who Plays MUAs, which divides video game players into four unique types, kind of like a personality type. In 2002, Serious Gaming Initiatives forges a link between the gaming industry and training, health, education, and public policy. 2003, Nick Pelling coins the term gamification. 2007, Bunchball created Dunder Mifflin Infinity, a gamified website for the TV show, The Office, and it receives over 8 million page views in six weeks. And in 2009, Quest to Learn accepts a class of sixth graders into a game-based learning environment. In 2010, DevHub adds a point system to its website and increases user engagement by 70%. Now at this point, gamification is becoming big. And in 2010, Gamification Co. holds the first gamification summit ever. And guess where that is? San Francisco, of course. In 2012, 45,000 enrolled in Professor Kevin Warbach's online gamification course through Coursera. In 2012, Mozilla Open Batches Initiative is launched. The open source badges can not be used to mark accomplishments online. And in 2012, Gartner predicts 70% of the global 2000 organizations will have at least one gamified application by 2014. And 2014, MT Research predicts that gamification will be a $2.8 billion industry by 2016, which is true, but it went way beyond that. It's now expected to become $11 billion industry by the end of this year. I hope you guys were paying attention because pop quiz time. Now, remember in the Q&A section, if you have the answer, write it in there because the more you get correct, the more you participate, the chances of winning something. So in what year did the first video game come out? In what year did the first video come out? I'm going to go and through all these answers after the talk to make sure because I know there's a delay. So let's go to the next question. What country invented the first board game? What country invented the first board game? All right, what airline did the first frequent flyer program? 
So what airline did the first frequent flyer program? Now this one's the hardest question in this deck most likely, which is who coined the term gamification? What was his name? And no, you cannot Google search and then type it in. That's called cheating. We don't do that. Sometimes we do though, but don't do it. All right, next question. What was the gamified website by Bunchball for the TV show The Office called? What was the gamified website by Bunchball for the TV show The Office called? And gamification is expected to become a what billion dollar industry by the end of 2020? Gamification is expected to become a blank billion dollar entry by the end of 2020. All right, that is the end of the pop quiz time, or this could be a complete trick. Anyway, it shall be a mystery, but let's dive back into the presentation now. Now, if you're a fan of Monty Python, high five virtually. I love Monty Python, and you'll notice that in that image below. But the fact is, is that InfoSec has always been gamified. Think about it, CTFs, hackathons, bug bounty. Many of us became hackers to beat games and to do better than our peers who were better than us. We found cheat codes and other methods for doing so. But most importantly, when we hunt for vulnerabilities, it's a game of how far does this foxhole goes? It's a constant, how can I outsmart this and that? Which of course, I had to create something about gamification and a chart. So remember to pay attention. So here we go. October 10th, 1995, Netscape launches the first ever cash reward for finding security bugs in the Netscape Navigator 2.0 beta. Now that's to note that is the closest thing that's ever started all about bug bounty. So now we go into the first DEF CON CTF was in 1996. And now bug bounty programs were created and managed by companies such as Google, Facebook, and Mozilla. Because of Netscape's success, this allowed companies to try to run their own programs so people could report vulnerabilities. Um, but it was also a time to do some sort of bilateral collaboration with the hacker community and the organization itself. This changes things a lot because also at that time, people were still very hesitant about the hacker community and working with them. But they also knew that they had to also crowdsource their security, not to replace their security team members, but they needed to have um, reporters, I mean, basically disclosers, to be able to report something so then they're able to catch it in time so they could prevent breaches from occurring. Now, Pod to Own started in 2007, and because of the success of the company bug bounty programs, the other thing was that you have to have a manager, a team of people basically that can fully focus on disclosures and making sure that there's a safe route of communicating with the hacker community and the organization itself. So bug bounty platforms came about in 2012, 2013. It was BugCrowd, HackerOne, then Synac. And basically it was the first time ever that now this is becoming a bigger deal and other companies that didn't know about bug bounty programs or didn't know about doing these type of partnerships would be something very helpful for their security team. Once again, bug bounty platforms were not meant to basically replace security team members. It was a way to make sure that if they didn't catch something that someone else in the crowd could because diverse look of eyes so people with different backgrounds all over the world and many eyes would be able to find things a lot faster than the security team, which is the best way how to protect your people and your company and its assets. So that's one thing is that I big kudos to bug bounty platforms because it was bug bounty programs that basically paved the way for um, hack at the army or hack the Pentagon. And it changed the way that people started seeing the hacker community, having a better perception of what the hacker community is. Even though we're still far behind on public's perception and changing it, it still was a big 
milestone for the hacker community. Now back onto this is in 2014 till today, gamification training has been on the rise, which we're gonna look into in a bit. All right, and it's back around for a pop quiz time. You guys ready? The first bug bounty program was created in what year? Which one was the first bug bounty and what year was it? Let's think. I will double check in the Q&A to make sure that you guys are getting these answers. Next question. When was the first CTF at DEF CON? What year was it? All right. Lifin of pop quiz time. Now let's dive into the brain. And if you guys know, I am obsessed with the brain and most of the time, every talk I do talks about the brain because we need to understand that a human element plays a lot larger role than anything in security. We're the ones that code, we're the ones that break things. And we also know how to fish people because we understand how human behavior works. So by knowing how the brain works and how it's stimulated, it allows us to have a better idea of how we can prevent things from occurring, but also how to be on our guard and be able to take a step back to understand what is actually happening inside. So let's get to know your brain. So those pop quiz questions earlier was actually there to stimulate the green section that you see in the left side, the temporal lobe. And now we're going to dive into that area because that's where the gamification thrives. And yes, on the other side, you see the amygdala and hippocampus in that area. We are going to talk about those two as well. So let's first go into the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe is involved in processing sensory input into derived meanings for the appropriate retention of visual memory, language comprehension, and emotion association. This is where gamification thrives and it's where the amygdala and hippocampus are. And yes, we're going to do an activity so you guys can understand a little bit how it works. So I'm going to read a definition of an item and you're going to guess what that is. All right. And remember, put in the Q&A. Those that participate, you will get a subscription to a training platform called Escalate. So here we go. A plant having a permanently woody main stem, usually growing to a high height and developing branches at some distance from the ground. What is it? So once again, I'll read it one more time. A plant having a permanently woody main stem, usually growing to a high height and developing branches at some distance from the ground. Now I'm gonna answer this for you because these are something so you have a better idea as an example. That's a tree. So if you were thinking tree, you're 100% correct. Next one, the nutritious orange to yellow root of a plant of the parsley family. The nutritious orange to yellow root of a plant of the parsley family. What is it, you guys? Next one, an article of furniture consisting of a flat top supported on one or more legs. What is it? Second to last one, here we go. An institution where instruction is given. An institution where instruction is given. What is it? A moving cage for carrying passengers from one level to another. A moving cage for carrying passengers from one level to another. Now, when I figured out what that term was, I immediately was like, I'm never ever gonna think of that thing the same way ever again. All right. So if you're wondering, what was that all about? Well, let me put it this way. So remember that temporal lobe, what it does? It basically, it takes descriptions and creates images. So what happens is that when you're hearing a, a description of an item, you're able to come up with an image immediately. That's what the temporal lobe does. It's where your memory is stored, but also it's where you're able to have visuals there and also to have where emotion is connected as well. And how that works is the amygdala and hippocampus plays a role. And that is the part where gamification thrives. So the amygdala controls your emotional responses and also helps your brain store memories, but also works with the hippocampus. 
And the hippocampus plays a huge role in your memory and navigation and emotional response. And of course, we're gonna dive into both of them. So the hippocampus. This is where short-term memories in the hippocampus are transferred to long-term memories in the temporal lobe. Our conscious memories are formed by the hippocampus taking a snapshot of a short-term working memory and committing it to a long-term memory stored in the temporal lobe. It's also known for your GPS, how you get around. You have this idea of how to connect one place to another so you could get from A to B. Now we're gonna do an activity here. And this one is gonna be a little bit challenging, but this is one that what you're gonna to need to do is read over this list. Then give you guys to read over it twice. And you wanna take count of the order that it's in. So after you read it twice to yourself, Try to remember it as much as possible. No, don't take a screenshot of it. Once again, that's cheating. Let's test your hippocampus. So this is what this activity does. All right, I think that's pretty good for you. So this is what you're gonna do next. You're gonna take a note of the listed items. You're gonna read through them once, then for a second time. And when you're done, raise your hand, except you can't raise your hand. So I already started a timer for you guys. So go ahead and pull up the draft or email, pull up your notes app and write down all the items that you saw. Try your best in order. If you can't, it's okay. Just make sure that you write them down as much as possible. All right, good luck you guys. I'm going to be in the chat area in the meantime while you're doing that. You have one more minute. We need the Jeopardy tune right now. I know I was thinking about doing that at some point, but I was worried that someone will get that song stuck in their head and then they're gonna DM me saying, thanks Chloe. <laughs> You ruined my head. I cannot sleep for the next few days because of you. And I'm like, eh, I don't feel like making people upset these days, especially with COVID. I want to yeah. be nice. <laughs> Too late. All right. And time. Pencils down. And if your hands are on the keyboard, they have to be lifted now. Now, let's go back into this. So, this is the list. How many did you get right? And were all 10 items in the correct order? If you did well, congrats. You have an incredible short-term memory in hippocampus. When it comes to learning, you need your long-term memory to be in good shape. And how do you work on this? So this activity itself, just make a visual story. That's what the experts do. So speed memory uh, folks, what they do is, for example, I was walking the streets of London and I carry my umbrella. And I was looking down and I stepped on something kind of weird with my shoe. And right there was like, it was some sort of cuddly toy, but I couldn't tell if it was like the head of a teddy bear that got cut off or if it was a melon stuffed animal. Anyway, I just kept walking and I almost went right into a tree because I almost slipped on what looks like kind of like a pink yogurt. I guess it was strawberry or something. Anyway, I was just glad that I didn't fall and I didn't go into that tree. But in that moment, because I felt like I was going to fall, suddenly I would have never caught that parrot that flew by in London. 
I mean, who would have had a parrot fly by in London? And I'm also glad because I was carrying my laptop and also was wearing this red jumper that I used to wear uh, when I played basketball with my father. Now, if you think of this, is the more creative and, and crazy your story can be, the more it gets attached to you. Not just that, but emotions are one of the things to also recall, is that emotions play a huge role when it comes to your memory. Hence why you remember your nightmares more than your regular dreams, because there's an emotion attached to a memory. So if you wanna recall things, have a strong emotion attached to it as well. Moving on, so how to improve your hippocampus. Just remember, gaming modules are definitely one of those things that definitely does it. Crossword puzzles, of course, taking a new route home is really important. So then you kind of know different layouts and figuring out how to get from point A to B on your own. It's really useful because then you're able to take in more information and you want to constantly keep stimulating and learning new things in life. Um, so then your hippocampus can still flex its memory. Now, we get to dive in my favorite part of the brain. Now the amygdala is an almond shaped section of nervous tissue located in the temporal side lobe of the brain, which is responsible for your emotions, your survival instincts and memory. Now remember, you cannot control it. It is completely subconscious. Only the prefrontal cortex can. And if you're wondering, wait, what? So we're gonna talk about the amygdala. So amygdala, how it works is that with basically things that you learn as a child, um, for example, like, you know, you know, don't touch the stove, it's hot, or seeing images in the media of, of anything. Basically, it just gets stored in there with emotion. And the thing is that it also does this thing where it separates um, basically who's like me, who's not like me, and it puts it in a way for survival. So the thing is that most of the time people that are introduced to the amygdala, they think of the fight versus flight mechanism, which it completely is, but it's also a, a sorter of deciding who's like you and who's connected to you, who has similarities as you, and who doesn't at all. So this is a way to know who to trust, so based on survival, um, I guess, of the fittest one could call it. Anyway, we're going to dive into a quick thing for you to have a better understand how powerful the amygdala is. So, here we go. So, you're going to pay attention to this video. I'm going to turn up my speaker so you can hear everything. And here we go. Pay attention. Watch this series of images very closely. Ready? Go. Do you recall seeing any shoes or keys? Probably not. At this speed, 80% of the people we showed this to don't see either the shoes or the keys. We'll slow it down. Did you see them this time? You probably did. Now. All right. How many of you guys saw the keys and the shoes first? Now, believe it or not, for the average human, they don't catch it. However, if you are a pen tester yourself or a red teamer, chances are you probably caught it because you're a little bit more focused on details. Not just that, but you are very highly stimulated in your amygdala area. So we're gonna go into the next part. Here we go, pay attention. We're gonna play a different series of images and test you on them after. Ready, go. Happen to notice any snakes or spiders? Chances are you did. In case you're thinking we slowed down the images, I assure you we did not. All we did was substitute the shoes and keys with pictures of snakes and spiders. Why did one set of images jump out at you while the other didn't? To answer that question. Oh, he can't, he doesn't need to answer the question for you. I'm gonna answer it for you. All right, so. This is what happened. Remember when I mentioned the amygdala, it has a socially constructed belief center. So basically anything that you've been told, so for example, like spiders and snakes, and you might not have been told directly, but indirectly in movies and TV shows or in books that spiders and snakes are dangerous. And because of that, 
you have this ability to be able to catch that immediately as a survival mechanism because you're amygdala, because there's now a strong association with a memory. Now, remember, keys and shoes, you may not have picked up on it. That's just because there's not a strong memory or emotion attached to it. However, socially constructed beliefs carry a heavy weight, especially when it comes to survival. So remember spiders and snakes, socially constructed idea, and this is why your amygdala is going off. Now, the one thing to note about the amygdala is you probably have heard this before. It's called an amygdala hijack. So say, for example, you're driving in a car and you get in a car accident. If you've been in a car accident before and it's a bad one, you know what I'm talking about here. Suddenly, everything goes very, very slow. And now you're thinking in your mind, it's like, oh my God, my brain's going 100% like fully there. And that's why everything's going slow motion. No, your brain's always 100%. The thing is that's different is that amygdala hijack what happens is that it no longer needs to check in in the prefrontal cortex of your brain, which is the conscious part of your brain to decide whether or not it's a threat or not. And so that's the thing to recall is that amygdala hijack is the reason why, for example, you are going to be working out of fear. You might stay still or you might run because of this happening. So one thing to note about is that amygdala plays a huge role when it comes to your emotions and also how you react. But the thing that you should note is that once again, it has to check in the prefrontal cortex uh, usually to see whether or not it needs to take an action based on a threat. So remember, if you have amygdala hijack, chances are things are not going slow motion for you. Uh, what's happening is that you have the you don't have the ability to process information and to make a logical step forward. This is when we make mistakes. Um, but it's also how things slow down suddenly. So it's a really cool thing to know about the amygdala because that's kind of what we want to do, right? If you are someone who is a social engineer and you want someone to click on that link, you're going to either do two things. You're going to come off as someone that they can trust. Somehow you have to come across to trust them or to scare the crap out of them. Because if you scare the crap out of them, they're not gonna make the logical steps. They're gonna work around fear. And that's the scary part. So it's really important is to be acknowledged of that, is that the amygdala does control quite a bit, but once again, you can keep it in check as well with the prefrontal cortex. All right, moving on here. Now we're going to dive into why gamification helps security teams. Because let's be real, certifications are not enough always. New tools and new exploits come out all the time. And being aware of everything at all times and the trends along with burnout, the lack of team members, it leaves us in a security risk. I mean, how many of you guys experience a shortage on your team and having to take on other hats to help everyone else move along? Exactly. It's common. So we're going to dive in why it's important more than ever and how it's become a priority for InfoSec to get involved with gamification and why companies are now investing in gamification to help their security team. So overall, in 2020, gamification combined with other latest technologies and trends will have a significant impact on the design of employee performance, globalization of higher education and innovation. Thank you, Gartner. This is great because this took the words right out of my mouth. So we're going to dive into the facts um, because we run on facts within cybersecurity. And every company that truly cares about their security team needs to invest in their security team. And with gamification, we can solve the skills gap and know where our strengths and weaknesses are through an unbiased way. So let's dive into the facts, shall we? First things first. Within organizations that hold gamification exercises, hackathons, capture the flag, red team, blue team, or bug bounty programs are the most common. And almost all, 96% of those that use gamification in the workplace report seeing benefits. Now, more than half, 57% of respondents report that using games increase awareness and IT staff knowledge of how breaches can occur. And 43% said gamification enforces a teamwork culture needed for a quick and effective cybersecurity. But most importantly, the main takeaway is that 77% of senior managers agree that their organization would be safer if they used more gamification. 
because let's be real, is that when we are dealing with a breach, we're about more than 70% of us are going ad hoc. And only one third of companies usually have some sort of playbook in, in place. However, many of them are out of date. They haven't been revisited. It's not even planned to be revisited, to be worked on. And that's a scary thing is that we're not equipped for any breach. Majority of companies are not there yet. Also, to address the shortage in skilled cybersecurity workers, the report suggests that gamers, those engaged and immersed in online competitions, may be the logical next step to plug in the gap. Nearly all, 92% of responsibility that gaming affords players experience and skills critical to cybersecurity threat hunting, such as logic, perseverance, and an understanding of how to approach adversaries and a fresh outlook compared to traditional cybersecurity hires. And yes, we have a 3 million shortage right now. Fact number four, 77% of employees find game-based training to be more effective than traditional training methods. I mean, let's be real. How many of you guys really learn anything from textbooks these days? Not so much. However, if it's hands-on or something that stimulates us, it's completely integrated, it's interactive, I'm going to remember things a little bit more because of my hippocampus. Now, next one is fact number five. Biases, resumes, team building, and learning how to improve teams and provide more trainings and investing employees. These are all the reasons why gamification can help with finding talent and recognition. You can put them through CTFs. You can put them through gaming modules and the platforms themselves to have a better idea of where this person stands, especially if you're trying to hire them. The thing is, is that biases really do exist, like really exist. Uh, for example, I like to tell people that when I was applying for jobs, I decided to submit my resume under a male name, named Cody, by the way. Yeah, my name is Cody. And also Chloe. And I got more callbacks on the Cody than the Chloe. So biases do exist. It's the same resume and everything. But the thing is, is that there's still this belief, for example, for women, is that we're not technical enough, or we don't have enough leadership experience. And because of that, it prevents us from getting jobs. And that's a scary thing because once again, we're still relying on other things. We rely on basically making sure they have the perfect resume. And what that looks like is certs. And it's one of those things that years of experience in certs does not mean you have that ability to do your job. And that's the thing that we're running into is that we have a bunch of these entry level jobs, but they're like, we need three to four years of experience. That's not how it works, people. That's, that's not an entry level job. So the thing is, is that test them to see if they're able to do the job, not number of years, what certs they have, because you never know. Usually those ones tend to be the better performers anyway. And so that's one thing why we still have a skills gap, in my opinion, on many security teams because certs are not enough. I mean, how many guys have certifications? And how many do you believe think that these certs make you amazing at your job? At the end of the day, you know what made you amazing at your job? It's not about certs. It's how well you're putting energy into it and taking the time to learn things. Being a constant learner, being passionate, wanting to constantly learn is is definitely the main thing of how you got successful where you are. I mean, think about it. The other thing is with the skills gap, what's happening is that we're more prone to burnout and breaches on just in general, because you're asking other people to learn how to do other things, which they don't have time to do that anyway, if you're short on your team of people. And because of that, that causes a burnout situation. Also, you need to constantly invest in your team and their knowledge to make sure that they're on top of everything. And, you know, the best way how to do that is interaction. I mean, I'm hoping from this talk completely that you're able to recall at least a good percentage of them because the whole thing itself is it's totally interactive with you. So it's really important is to understand that we do have a skills gap and gamification is one way how we can solve that.
And not just that, the military has all been in about it anyway. I mean, gamified learning environments are powerful tools for engaged and motivated learning experience. They are a central component of cybersecurity training strategy, which is a national imperative. Such environments help produce qualified personnel to meet the demand signal. In other words, strong correlations between gaming and cybersecurity activities, gaming and retention, and gaming and recruitment. And last but not least, when we invest in our security teams, we don't know where the risks lay. Where are the weaknesses and strengths are? In return, it opens us to having breaches, burnout, skills gap, and unhappy employees. And a compliance checklist is the bare, bare minimum of anything. So if you care about your company, you care about your people, invest in them. I cannot push that enough as it is because without a security team, a decent security team, you run into having a breach and breaches tend to happen because we're burned out or we, have, we don't have as many people on team or we're not highly skilled on certain areas on the team. And because of that, it puts us at risk. Now, when your security is at risk for your company, what happens is that if you have a breach, it gets out there, your customers are not gonna be happy. Chances are they might not ever return to you because their information is now out there and they trust you at the beginning to keep them safe. So we see this with startups all the time is that when there is a breach that does occur, then they lose their customers and then they lose their company. And so important for us to recognize security. We are so heavily invested in sales and marketing. And the thing is at the end of the day, it's the security that keeps us safe, keeps us going because without them, we wouldn't exist as a company. And of course, I have to throw in one more question for you guys. So in the Q&A section, tell me, what percentage of companies that adopt gamification in the workplace report seeing benefits? What was that percentage? I know that snuck up on you guys big time. All right, let's go to the next part. So I want to dive into how gamification has transformed lives. The thing is that we should note is that gamification can teach and lead new people to enter the space or to be recognized for their talent. This could help solve the gender biases that InfoSec has been dealing with ongoing and help us with the 3 million personnel shortage. But also it helps us be able to have more people for entry level jobs to come in and to really see them grow because those people are gonna do a fantastic job. You just need to open the door for them. So gamification can do that in many ways. And also recognition is one of those things as well. So let's go dive first into Veronica. So Veronica, she has a BA in uh, computer science and she says by accident, she planned to study Latin and Greek, but was also taking computer science classes. But when leaving college, she started having more of an interest to start a PhD instead. But she decided, I'm going to do youth development for five years after graduating. And now the thing is, is that when she was doing it, she loved it, but it didn't challenge her or inspire or empower her. So she decided, you know, I think I want to look elsewhere. And she came across this partnership with the DOD boot camp. Um, it was an ad and it drew her in. And in the ad itself, it said they were looking for problem solving ability, being able to work on problems for a long time and willingness to do discipline learning. That was the only thing that they needed to have to attend this boot camp to become a security person. Now she applied, she got in. And what happened was that one of the things to note about her is that she loves to work with patterns and puzzles. And so she decided this was the perfect thing. Maybe this is good for her. So she started out with some reverse engineering challenges on the platform. And afterwards, um, she completed the six month DOD boot camp and went to work at a consulting company for about six months within InfoSight. Um, her title was basically a technology consultant, but was really actually a pen tester. Um, afterwards, she actually was already being eyed by another group of individuals and other companies during the boot camp, and kept trying to get her to come over to their side and so she did 
um, because they had an opening and really wanted her to join due to her performance on Escalade during boot camp. And the one thing you should note is that she is still doing this kind of stuff and she never set out to be a hacker as a goal. She didn't even know that, that was something or a possibility for her. But if you were to go through her Google search history, you would see that web app strategies and how one can manipulate to change and shape and code. And that's one of those things that, you know, once again, these are people that have no idea that this is an industry for them. No idea that they would make a great security team member until they have an opportunity. And it was this gamified platform that basically helped train her in such a fast time, six month time to learn everything to become a pen tester with no previous experience. That's incredible. Now, let's go into Valentina. So she first studied psychology and wasn't a big fan of math, but she had to take one of the math classes in college and suddenly she discovered a love for math. So she went to school to study math at UIC. Um, undergrad, she did an internship in the physics department with some basic coding and took a class in computer science as well. And afterwards, she became an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank. She discovered she had this passion in computers. The ability to tell a computer what to do and build anything is pretty empowering. So computer security sounded pretty interesting to her and maybe hacking. And hacking sounded pretty cool to her. Plus, she saw in movies, um, several different movies, and one that we all kind of know of, which is called Hackers. She really liked that early computer internet culture and the hacker community image, and it attracted her to it. And so when she saw the press release from the mayor of Chicago about taking applications for a special boot camp, uh, which was sponsored with Escalate and DOD, she applied and got a spot. She had absolutely zero experience. She doesn't know how to code or anything really. She had some basic idea of coding for her physics internship, but really nothing else than that. And within three months of that six month boot camp, she was offered a position as a software developer and on the security team, and then became a vulnerability researcher. So, I'm also looking for stories. So if you have a story of how gamification impacted you in a positive way, let me know. DM me on Twitter or Instagram, whatever is easier for you. So last pop quiz question is, do you guys know which person was inspired by the movie Hackers? What was her name? Which person was inspired by the movie Hackers? All right, so from stories brain functioning and history is clear gamification is a necessity. So we can all be superheroes every day. And if you're wondering, Chloe, what superheroes? Because in InfoSec, no matter what your job is in InfoSec, the thing is you could do sales, you do marketing operations and support InfoSec companies. You could be on the security team. But the thing is, is that we need security more than ever before. We're keeping people safe every single day behind the scenes. And that's what it is, is the invisible superheroes. And, you know, I wish the more and more the public knew about the hacker community and how much we're doing for them. So it can change the public perception of who we really are. So here are some resources for you guys. Um, that is the ITSP one, if you're interested. The Hacker Book Club link is there. Also, if you are a hacker yourself or you're someone who supports the hacker community, please go ahead and sign that petition and share it. It is a way for us to get public perception to change, but also for government to look at legislation and to make some amendments to it, and also for organizations to be able to understand a little bit more on why disclosure is important. Last but not least, if you have any questions about point three security, there is the link right below. Um, any questions anyone has? I'm gonna go in the Q&A section and turn my camera on. But first, I just wanna say thank you guys for existing. Thank you for having me. Um, Tactical Edge Summit, thank you for having me. This is fantastic. And yes, that is a picture of Luna and Sherlock <laughs> in that image being cats because they were destroying the carpet because that's what cats do. They kind of like to destroy things all the time. Dogs do too. But I mean, like cats, they top over glasses and stuff. I'm pretty sure my dogs would do the same.
Thank you so that much. Was, uh, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, so Salma actually has an example of okay. gamification. Again, Salma oh, never yeah. been involved in cybersecurity. This is the first time that she's involved in anything to do with cybersecurity. Her focus is communications. And, <laughs> and, and, and on Monday, on Monday, uh, we had a good friend, John Spasik. He gave his session on gamified tabletop exercises, which is it's fantastic. And Salma then participated. Nice. First time. Uh, it was a really good experience. And now hearing your presentation, really through gamification, you can learn a lot and you can, as you, as you said, you can train your team. And for example, for me, communication, I can get some things from gamification also for, for training people that works with me, you know? So hey, in the experience that I have Monday, for example, well, I learned a lot of how hey, in, in, the, um, in the moment that you have a critical uh, time in your, in your uh, help me, Edgar, <laughs> you have, we, we receive a call because there was an encryption right of information of the, yeah. of the enterprise right. and, uh, and I was marketing and uh, they call me like, and they want some, some ransom, some money to liberate the information, the, the liberation that, uh, data, yeah. of the data. So after that, we realized that there were a lot of things happening in the, in, in the enterprise, you know, where lots of things happening uh, besides uh, that were not only the ransom, that were another things that they want to to do with uh, with that encryption of the data. So look, let, I, I, let me stop you there, Salma. Uh, you know, again, Chloe, I want you to understand. Salma is a professional uh, broadcaster in Colombia, right? Gotcha. Her role is communications. Look at her, listen to her talking about ransomware, <laughs> encryption, data, all because the gamification that happened on Monday for yeah. 30 minutes. Yeah, it, that's all it takes. I mean, the thing is, is that a lot of people don't understand security, don't understand why they should have a 2FA or any of that stuff because they don't see themselves as a target. But then when they become a target and it happens to them, they become a victim, suddenly they care. And this is the thing that we see happening in companies is that breaches are occurring because we have uh, social engineers that are phishing. Um, and by the way, by social engineers, ones are criminals because they didn't get permission to do so, they're actually doing it to do something bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically what they did is they contact usually the people that are not on the security team to get access to the data or to get into your inbox to be able to get closer. And so that's the thing to note is that um, a lot of people don't understand that you have to train everyone and everyone has to care, but there's this real apathy towards security um, across different teams outside of security. And it's really frustrating for security folks because we're like, no, you need to care because you're going to put us at risk and I have to take care of you <laughs> and what you did to us. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and again, that was, again uh, on Monday's uh, presentation by Mike Kaiser from Cellpoint, one of our fantastic sponsors, he was talking about identity. And at yeah. the end of, of his presentation, Salma had an expression on her face. She goes, wait a second. So when I download that application, and I take my photo, my auto photo, like, uh, like uh, Javad says, <laughs> my selfie, and then to age me, I'm giving them all my information. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. And then, and then yesterday, Salma, with uh, Tyrone and his uh, recon OSINT. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like this, oh my God. He's like, I got to throw away all my apps. I can't do training that. Exercise apps, they have but, all my information. Oh, they got everything. They got but, everything. but again, they, you know, and, and again, Salma, we, we're going to call Salma a regular person. Regular yeah. people don't <laughs> understand this, right? Unless nope. you put them in a situation 
that one, as you're saying, is gamified, so it's fun. Yeah. You know, and 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 it's open. It's open to learning. And and Salma, this whole week has given has been a gamified uh, <laughs> experience, and that's why she's absorbing all this. So it's absolutely, hundred percent. I agree with you. Gamified is, is the way to go. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, the one thing to note is that uh, there's a lot more attacks these days via CM SMS. So the thing is, is that you have to be very careful of getting fished on your cellular device um, because chances are you're more likely to click on a link. And so yeah. that's one thing to always remember is that it's not just by email, it's also through text. And yes, I, the thing that drives me up the wall is like, you'll basically, you'll see a sign somewhere posted on the street about a new application and be like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to download it right now. Yeah. And I'm just like, are you crazy? Are the you QR, not or, or just, Right? The just, QR code. Here, <laughs> use this to scan and get the app. I'm like, oh like, my like, God. Uh, yeah, exactly. But that's the thing. They don't know. And, and it's sad because, I mean, you see a lot more of this type of rent up situations, the security situations that occur in more of the technology type of sections of a magazine or in the news. But for broadcasting like news like the big outlets sometimes they mm. don't do these things until much later and it's not a big story to, to them either unless it has some celebrity attached to it like we saw with the twitter um, breach and it's one of those things that's like there's a reason why the public doesn't know these things either it's because they don't understand that they are literally a target every single person is a target at the end of the day whenever there's a breach you are now a target Right, and and I think one of the one of the reasons I think is because we say you know privacy is important, but they're like they don't understand why yeah. it's important. So it's got to be a way to to explain that better. Um, what's um, point three security? What what's your focus in there as, as a company? Yeah. So uh, what I do there, or what I do at, I mean, what. What point three provides? Yeah, what point three provides, and then what you do there? Right. So, um, point three security. Basically, um, we have a platform called Escalate, which we saw in those two examples of personal lives. That was a partnership with Escalate and the DoD. Um, basically, what Escalate does, it's a it's a way how you can cultivate talent and on secure teams around the world to help security pros continually assess and grow their skills and expertise in engaging ways such as gamification um, as a way to measure performance on an equitable and unbiased basis which is really important so you can see um, behind scenes how each person is doing on your team and how your team looks like as a whole what are the issues and areas that your team needs to work on together um, but also is a good way to use for promoting another individual because we do find quite often it's the one that's silent in the back that no one was able to predict would be the higher skilled person and then they end up being the higher skilled person according to the platform and also uh, people use it to for hiring purposes to see whether or not the person is able to do what they can do without having to look at their resume first. That's, that's fantastic. That's really yeah. good. And how yeah. long has uh, Point3 Security been around? Ooh, a good number of years now. Um, yeah. But yeah, and we're always coming up with new modules. It's kind of like, for example, um, I always try to explain to friends and family, think of Netflix, but you have all these different gaming challenges that take hours sometimes, okay. or sometimes days. Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> It's fun. We have a lot of CTFs too. So nice. You know. And I believe we ha have uh, two winners. Tawa oh. is one of them. And yeah. then uh, let's see here. Who else was the other one? Yeah, there was one more. Lorenzo. Lorenzo? Yep. Okay. okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, so I'll make sure I'll send you their uh, email address. Yeah. And then I will send them their gifts. Oh, fantastic. All Brilliant. right. Well, Chloe, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here with us at uh, Tactical Edge. It was a pleasure meeting you and hosting you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chloe. All right. Bye, everyone. All right. <laughs>
And uh, for everyone, all right, we're a little bit over, uh, but uh, it's cool. It's fantastic. So uh, I want to say thank you to uh, uh, our sponsors, Ativo Networks, Cellpoint, Exabeam, and uh, CyberArk. And what's the invitation for all our Asians, attendees? You please go and visit our sponsors. In the sponsors area, they have a lot of information they want to share with you. They have a special activities. They have material you can download. So please go and visit them. That's the invitation yes. for Perfect. everyone. And okay. then join us. And then join us back at 2 p.m. Central Time uh, for our last two uh, presenters. We have Dr. Andrea L Little Limbago. Uh, she's fantastic. She's going to talk about privacy and um, and policy worldwide and in, in the strange world that we're living in her conversation it's going to be extremely extremely interesting and then we end with uh george or from scythe um talking about uh, people teaming and don't forget after that at 4 30 p.m today 4 30 p.m central we have our after party so everyone is invited uh nice band calais salma watched uh some of the video and uh, it was impressive. <laughs> really nice. You can't miss that because it's gonna be really nice. It's, it's big really good. For you. <laughs> yeah. it's so fantastic Friday. <laughs> fantastic Friday. We'll see everyone in a little while. And 2 p.m. Central Time. See you soon. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye.